None of you are here to listen to me. You're here to listen to our uh, esteemed speakers from Europe, but I do have some additional business and background to hopefully quickly go through. Uh, technically, the course runs from 4.15 to 5.30. I think we may go over a little bit today. Uh, the format we usually hold is two speakers per session, approximately 30 minutes. That allows us to host, uh, uh, offer 16 speaking slots. Europe is a very large place. Uh, 30 plus countries, nearing 40, depending upon where you draw the, the, the boundary lines. And obviously we can't fit uh, all of Europe in each quarter, but we try and cover as much as we can. It also provides for a little bit of contrast between different European countries and regions. So, and we talk about essentially what's happening in Europe on the entrepreneurship scene. This is an unusual map of Europe because it shows Europe at the, um, at the regional level. Uh, there are national boundaries in here, but this, if you think of Europe as regions, regions being equivalent to states uh, in the U.S. context, you'll see, you'll see how very uh, diverse and fragmented Europe, Europe is. Uh, some of these regions will be more and better known to you, such as Catalonia here, the Basque region, Bavaria. We won't name all of them, but this, is, uh, this shows uh, very deeply the the deep diversity and also fragmentation of Europe, which is one of their challenges. And we talk also about the differences between Europe and California, Silicon Valley specifically. Um, part of what we do is draw contrasts uh, between different parts of Europe and between what's happening in Europe and talk about the challenges that entrepreneurs face in different parts of Europe. I was fortunate enough to be invited to speak at Global Entrepreneurship Week in Minsk, Belarus in November. And so here you see, this is the masterclass coaching session for Belarusian startups in Minsk, uh, the Global Entrepreneurship Week conference. And two or 300 meters away is the KGB in the upper right hand corner and Lenin, statues of Lenin. So this is not meant to characterize, this is really quite extreme for the current European context, but I just wanted to give you a very concrete example of some of the recent history that, that parts of Europe are coming from that can make entrepreneurship very difficult from a cultural, from a social, legal, uh, and other, other points of view. Um, so I'll go into more detail, but we're very thankful to bring this course to you uh, because of our European government partners and corporate partners. We'll say more about that in a few minutes. Uh, today's speakers are Ann Glover, who is CEO, co-founder of Amadeus Capital Partners, and Jose de Franca, of Chairman and CEO of Portugal Ventures out of London and Lisbon, respectively, uh, the two leading venture capital firms in their respective countries. Um, just a quick glimpse at their websites. I invite you to visit these outside of class or in class if you've uh, got a, a pad with you. Um, and uh, this is a map basically showing which countries we'll be covering in terms of speakers. You can see uh, e even with presenting 16 speakers, there are still major gaps in what we can present to you this year. Um, what we'll be talking about today are essentially what's happening at Amadeus and Portugal Ventures, uh, the differences between Silicon Valley and Portugal in the UK, uh, how their own venture capital firms are impacting, how they shape, how they look at the entrepreneurship ecosystems in their particular countries, what's different about the UK and, and Portugal, for example. Uh, this is the class schedule. There, this is a bit subject to change, although it's 90% fixed. We do have a couple of gaps. We just confirmed about an hour ago that on January 28th, in addition to our main Swedish speaker um, from Senian Lab, we will be featuring for the first time a co-working space, hackerspace startup boot camp out of Ljubljana, Slovenia called Hekovnik. Um, we'll say a few, more about that in a, in a few minutes. But uh, in terms of the types of companies, we do cover mostly software in the internet area. Uh, we are, however, also presenting an, a very interesting medical, so digital healthcare medical device company out of Belfast, out of the University of Ulster, and of Slovakia, very interesting energy, um, essentially oil ex exploration technology company. Uh, and I'll just go through quickly uh, some of the future speakers we're going to be having next week, January 14. We're focusing on Ireland and Italy. Maurizio Rossi of HR Farm Ventures, just outside of Venice, Italy's leading accelerator. And John Breslin, who's one of 
Ireland's best known entrepreneur professors out of the University of Galway and on the director of boards, uh, one of his multiple startups. So uh, just a quick run through of some of their websites, H Farm Ventures, again in the Veneto region, uh, NUI Galway, University of Galway on the west coast of Ireland, Senian Lab out of Lean Shipping University. Peter Bunas will be presenting this as our official uh, Venova speaker. Hekovnik, again, out of Slovenia and Ljubljana. Uh, Intellisense out of the University of Ulster in Belfast, uh, our official Invest Northern Ireland speaker. Geothermal Anywhere, our first startup out of Slovakia to be presenting uh, with a very interesting, again, um, this is essentially plasma, plasma drill bit. Instead of grinding its way through rock, it essentially burns its way like a, a, an arc welding torch. Um, Pretzi out of Budapest, the leading startup out of Budapest. Uh, Angry Birds, Peter Vesterbacke will be here on March 4th along with the uh, Pretzi team. And then on the last date, uh, March 11, we'll be presenting Garage 48, which is Estonia's leading startup boot camp. And we're hoping to bring another leading boot camp accelerator out of Eastern Europe from another Eastern European country that we haven't covered to date uh, on, on March 11 as well. And this will be the, this is the official Enterprise Estonia speaker. Um, just a quick overview of their Stanford partners. We're very pleased to welcome for the first time Venova, the Swedish governmental innovation agency for innovation systems, and Lidgard, would you please raise your hand, is the Venova representative here in Silicon Valley, based at Stanford, very interestingly, just around the corner. Um, we're very pleased to have Sweden on board as, as an official partner this year. We're also very pleased to have, for the first time, the Northern Ireland government through Invest Northern Ireland join us as a partner. And their company, as I mentioned, is IntelliSense, which is a spin out from the University of Ulster in Belfast. And they have a major representation here in the Silicon Valley uh, uh, area as well. And then we're also very pleased, let's see, by the way, where is the Invest Northern Ireland representative? Is Brian here? Yes, Brian? Brian Glynn. Um, and then finally, we're pleased to welcome back Enterprise Estonia for uh, fifth year as a founding partner of our program course here at Stanford. Where's Andres Virg? Here's Andres Virg of Enterprise Estonia. Um, just a quick glimpse at some of their websites. I invite you to visit those as well. And then on the uh, industry side, we're also pleased to mention that uh, Oric has agreed to come on as one of our industry partners this year. Is Don Keller here or other ORIC representative? It's all right, we just sealed the deal over the weekend. Uh, but these, these partnerships are very much appreciated because they help us develop relationships in Europe, here in the Valley, and also provide financial support for the videotaping and other <coughs> course costs such as the dinners and other related expenses. <coughs> excuse, excuse me. So this is a summary of, uh, again, where our partners are coming from this, this year, our European government partners. Uh, this is where we've been over the past four years. You can see that we've covered a lot of territory, but with some major gaps in Eastern Europe, uh, some of which we're closing today. Um, course requirements, we've already covered this, thank goodness. Course logistics, everyone's here, so you presumably know where we are. Uh, recommend you consider joining our online communities, which are substantial. We've, we've had a LinkedIn group for four years now, which is going to be passing 10,000 in the next couple of weeks. We've also started a new meetup group, Google Plus group, and we'll be putting online our new Pinterest group uh, as a way to basically showcase to people outside of the area what's happening uh, here in the classroom, a little bit more visible basis, but also part of what I'm personally doing on behalf of Stanford at a number of the conferences that I speak at in Europe, such as in Belarus. Uh, video recording, I think I've already gone over the ground rules there. Um, thank you to Stanford Video for providing those services. Again, the dinners are voluntary. I think we've explained. Uh, are there any questions on the dinners or video or anything else before we jump into Anne and Jose? Great. Um, uh, Professor Larry Leifer is also uh, a faculty member on, on ME421 as well. I am based out of the Center for Design Research. And thank you. Thank you. Um, out of the design group in mechanical engineering. Uh, and we will kind of touch on the course overview and goals because I think we really want to get to the speakers at, at this point. Uh, okay, so right now we're going to jump to Ann Glover. Amadeus Capital is the 
leading venture capital firm in the UK. They're headquartered originally in, and Anne, feel free to correct me, originally both. in Cambridge, no, but both. Both. originally both in Cambridge and London. And London. Uh, Amadeus Capital has played a key role in the growth of the Cambridge technology cluster and in spinning out a number of very, very important companies from Cambridge University uh, in both semiconductors and other life sciences and other technologies o over the years. So they are a very big hitter on the UK scene and European scene. And let me bring up Anne's slides. And Anne, we appreciate your coming such a very long distance to be with us. OK, thank you. Um, well, good afternoon. Um, I should tell you a little bit about me first. Um, uh, I'm actually bilingual. Uh, if I start sleep, slipping into American slang, that's because I spent 13 years here, and I studied here from, uh, uh, from age 22 onwards. I was a material scientist, so I'm really happy to meet and greet uh, engineers. But I went straight into business, went to Yale, and spent 13 years in the US. And I have to tell you, it was the best decision of my life because I basically got imbued with American optimism. And, uh, the, and I come back regularly on any invitation, and Burton gave me this invitation, to get an injection of optimism. And so I'm here with a New Year's resolution that 2013 is going to be better in Europe than it has been for the last four years. <laughs> so. Um, the, uh, in 1989, I returned to the UK, uh, actually by accident, but I, that's a story I'll tell at dinner. Um, and I've spent 23 years in venture capital and in entrepreneurship in the UK, 20 of them as a VC and three running one of my portfolio companies that listed on the uh, London Stock Exchange. Today, I, uh, 15 years ago, I founded Amadeus with another colleague, Herman Hauser. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about that. And uh, we, I am today chairman of the VC Council of EVCA, which is the European Venture Capital Association. So I'm steeped in, in, in venture. And I have to tell you, we've come full circle. When we started in 1995, 96, 97, um, it was a nascent industry. We are back. We are shrunk. But we're starting again. And I'm still in the game, and I intend to stay in the game, because it's a great time to be there. So let me tell you the history. We're an early stage investor. Um, we also uh, consider ourselves business builders. Um, it's not just about quick turns of, of, uh, of capital. We are most proud of the four companies on the right, all of whom at one point or other listed. So Cambridge Silicon Radio was and still is um, the leading supplier of Bluetooth devices in the world. And it basically achieved that by building a Bluetooth um, uh, design on a single chip when everybody else thought it could only be done on two. Um, the, uh, the company is still listed on the London Stock Exchange. You won't notice that any of these are household names because we're not in the consumer space. We basically invest in deep technology of all kinds. And it can come from a research base or it can come out of um, other companies. Uh, Transmodes in wireless, um, uh, wireless uh, backhaul, wireless access. Again, a Swedish company built from scratch, listed on the Stockholm Exchange in 2011, the first tech IPO for four years in Europe. And uh, has done very well, and it's increased its share price by about 60% from float. Optos is a Scottish company. It's in retinal diagnostics. For any of you who are, well, actually, you're all a bit young, but nevertheless. For any of you who have any concerns about eye disease, it does a scan of the back of the retina and detects um, eye disease early. And 95% of its revenue when we started came from the US. They're installed in optometrists around the country here. Go and ask for an Optimap. And it avoids dilation, and it prevents disease early. It's still run out of Scotland. It's also listed on the Stock Exchange in London. And last but not least is Selexa, which came out of Cambridge University and was um, a, a revolutionary approach to DNA sequencing, transformed the cost of that. And if any of you have had your genome sequenced or, or are thinking about it, it's now down to 
$10,000 or you know, maybe even lower. It's almost certainly being done on a Selexa machine. It was bought by Illumina for $600 million about four years ago. So those are the kinds of companies we create. We consistently try to be at the forefront of, of technology and we are investing as a company in developing the ecosystem within Europe, which is, is necessary and hard but also very exciting. This slide just looks at the number of man years that we have in, in our team in experience. The only reason I put it here is um, that historically, the financial industry in Europe, at least in London, came from financiers and consultants, not from engineers or startup professionals. And all of us are engineers, startup professionals, or entrepreneurs. And this just basically says, that's who we are. What we're not, we, we're certainly numerate, but we didn't come out of a banking background and we didn't, um, uh, didn't come out of a pure business only background. We see about 600 deals a year. That's to give you a sense of the scale of the, of the deal flow. We do about six, so 1%. Uh, so that's about 8,000 deals since, we, since 2000. And uh, again, uh, it's sort of heavily biased towards deep technology. Even in the software space, it's very much enterprise software or security software. Um, and you will find that you may or may not know these names, but, um, but they'll be leaders in their market niches. The big change in the time that I've been here is this chart. And this is the percentage of serial entrepreneurs we've been able to back with our uh, three funds. Each, the first one was raised in about 98, the second one 2000, the third one in 2006. So finally, in this sort of 20 year period, I've seen the, the, the entrepreneurial ecosystem develop to the point that we are now able to back serial entrepreneurs. We'll certainly back first time entrepreneurs as well. But this was one of the big differences that I, I, I observed when I, I saw the, the difference between Silicon Valley in the 90s and what we were dealing with in the UK. So I, th I think that the problem or the challenges of European entrepreneurship, at least uh, in the markets that we're working with, is not the the availability of talent. It's the availability of money. So let me co go on to that. Because of reputation, um, all the deal flow is in blue is UK. We've expanded outside um, the UK. The, the turquoise is Europe. And you'll see that we get deals from the US and also elsewhere, including Africa, um, actually, because of emerging markets in mobile communications. So we attract that deal flow and we try to find a way, if we can, to back the best in the world um, at, almost from wherever it comes. And we dig deep in our sectors. This is just a chart um, of, the st of the telecom stack, and it shows our 17 mobile investments. And it goes from the infrastructure to devices to apps. It's across the spectrum. And what we try to be is embedded in the sectors that we know so that you're not coming up a learning curve every time you look at a new investment. And in fact, you're trying to anticipate industry trends alongside the majors so that you are investing in the next generation. Uh, because of that, we're able to uh, get exponential growth out of these, um, these sectors, even when the sectors themselves aren't growing at that kind of rate. So, I mean, telecoms is, in, other than applications, is actually not a very high growth uh, sector, but it's a very innovative sector. And there's an opportunity always to replace technology in the next generation product cycle. This, the, the next thing that we do is focus not on making regional winners, but on making global winners. So the way in which we portray that, there are 30 companies in our portfolio at the moment. 22 of them sell into emerging markets. 20, uh, 26 of them sell into North America, 19 are global. So yes, we are investing in Europe, but we are investing in companies that, that basically are world beaters. And that is one of the characteristics of what we do as Amadeus. <coughs> And we have to struggle with exits. Um, certainly, we enjoyed the bubble when it happened, but this is a series of exits. And basically, you have to be able to exit at any time in a, in a financial cycle. And so this just shows that sometimes it's IPO if the markets are good, sometimes it's trade sales. But you basically have to exit at any time, because otherwise, you're not doing your job for your investors. So that's who we are. 
this all sounds great, right? We're an experienced early stage investor. We build businesses. We are the front of trends. We know our industries. We create ecosystems. So how is life in Europe today? Well, it's a challenge because this is where the industry is, not where Amadeus is. This is where the industry is relative to the US. So the average fund size is 60% of a US fund. Now, if you've got a smaller fund, generally means you don't have as much dry powder to support your companies. That means that you've, you, you've basically got to be very careful about syndication. The number of funds is less than half. When you multiply those two, the availability of capital is a quarter. So the, and the economy is about the same size. And certainly the number of startups is about the same. So there's a quarter of the capital available for entrepreneurs to access, the VC capital. Business angel capital is about equivalent in size, and that is also emerging as a major source of, of funding for companies. So we're subscale. We're still subscale. So what does that do? What that means is that pricing, this is the pricing, relative pricing, US versus um, Europe, for all stages on the left hand over, t over time and on the right hand just in first half 2012. And it's converged to about 40% of pricing um, the levels on, at all stages uh, than it is here. So it's harder to get money, and unfortunately, it's more expensive to get money. That means it's really tough on these entrepreneurs. And the entrepreneurs, by the way, are really good because they, they basically have to be in order to make this work. But from a VC perspective, if you can find a really great one, those are good economics. And to show the, the history, why did I say was back to the future? We started in 1997. And at that time, there was roughly three and a half billion euros a year invested in venture. In the last two years, it's been less than that. So there was the bubble, there was a crash, there was the credit bubble, and then there's the financial crisis. And since the financial crisis fundraising has been so tough, the level of investment has fallen to levels lower than it was in 97, which is when I started trying to help make a European VC system work. So the big difference and the positive difference is the dark blue versus the purple. The dark blue is the amount of money going into seed and startups, and it's much higher than it was in 97. Entrepreneurship is alive and well. It's the follow-on capital. It's the later stage capital that has disappeared from the environment. And what we have to do is we have to go find it elsewhere. We have to come here. We have to syndicate with the valley. We have to syndicate with corporations. We have to invent other people to work with in order to make our companies grow. So the startup scene is fantastic. Entrepreneurship is great. It's the availability of follow-on finance that's a challenge. But that should be, in some ways, good news, because low fundraising vintages offer great returns. This slide just shows the sort of as much as possible the ebb and flow of returns. And you can see that in 96, 97, which was post the 91 recession, actually, the returns were OK. These are European returns. I'm, sadly, they're not as good as the US. So, um, the, but they can see that the bars are higher than the, num than the line, and the line is the number of funds. There was a lot of funds raised in the, in the bubble in 2000. And then, but the actual returns for the four years following that were depressed because there was too much money in the system. By, that, by the time that was washed through 04, 05, 06, you got back to decent returns again when the fundraising climate was tough. It was been bad during the, the credit bubble because the, the funds raised at that time, again, were slightly easier and there was too much money around. It's tough to raise money today. These are going to be the best vintages. And that's why I'm still in the game, because basically I think it's going to be a great future. UK has always been the largest market. It's about uh, roughly just under 30%. That's in terms of invested capital. Um, I think it's an Anglo-Saxon uh, sort of financial model. That's partially why um, it's been the largest market in, in Europe. Um, and it's still a great place to invest. Um, 
However, you have to choose your moments. And this is a sort of knockoff of a Silicon Alley Insider graph that you may have seen as the Gartner curve. And really, you should be investing at the seed stage so that you can get TechCrunch helping you to sell the company for a lot of money very quickly. Or you um, basically wait until it's had all its teething problems and try and catch it just at the point of takeoff in expansion and then get to the upside of um, the buyer as a real company. Frankly, in between, there's a big desert at the moment. And it's true here, and I think it's also true in Europe. Series B onwards is very difficult to support. Um, so what are the challenges? The challenges of fundraising. So I've, I've explained that the amount of money available is very limited. The Euro crisis. People don't understand that the Euro crisis is only about GDP, that what we're investing is in, in innovation, and that's growing at much higher rates, and it can start anywhere and be sold anywhere. Poor VC returns. We've got a track record problem that we have to overcome. Huge regulatory burden coming in from Europe, trying to sort out the financial crisis. And what that has meant is that banks, insurance companies, and pension funds are all being asked to carry a lot more capital on their balance sheets. The capital adequacy ratios that are related to risk capital, private equity and VC, have gone up. And that means they're pulling out of the business. The fund of funds who used to support us basically are also struggling because two layers of fees don't work. And the large pools of capital, the sovereign wealths, Norwegian, 700 billion oil fund, can't invest in VC because the VC funds are too small. And they, in fact, own 2% of all equities worldwide, but they're not in private equity at all because they would swamp it. So we have to reinvent our LP base yet again. And that means we have to go and find family offices, endowments, corporates, owners of capital who are interested in taking risk and moving forward. And that's what we're doing. And the other challenge is exits. The, uh, there's been a great step forward here with the Jobs Act in terms of um, providing an on-ramp for um, IPOs. There has, uh, frankly, Transmode in 2011, May 2011, it's the last tech IPO I can remember in Europe. Um, there's been, I think, one from Czechoslovakia on NASDAQ. Um, but you need the IPO market to act as a foil for value creation, as an alternative strategy to get corporations to pay up. They are very smart, and they're not going to pay more than they have to unless you can um, actually persuade them that you have an alternative. So unfortunately, the lack of a viable IPO market in Europe at the moment is depressing prices for us. And European stock market investors are risk averse and rather dividend driven, which means that uh, they're not that interested in new, in new um, issues. So we have to scale the companies to successfully list them in the US, which we believe we can do. And we have to create globally compelling stories to sell to the US corporations who have all this ex-US cash that they're not going to repatriate because of taxes and need to make acquisitions with. So those are the two exit strategies that we're working on. And what this basically says is that we have to be entrepreneurs as well. VCs are about backing entrepreneurship, but we have to be entrepreneurial in redesigning our own business in order to make it work. And that's exactly what we're doing. We have offices in Cambridge and London. They started at the same time. I lived in London. Herman lived in Cambridge. And uh, we weren't going to move, so we started the firm together. <laughs> and uh, we have now got a presence in the Bay Area as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, I'd like to kick off a couple of questions. One, uh, you talked about reinventing the LP base. Yes. How, how do you do that? That's really difficult. Um, because these are, many of them you said, family offices, small, small investment houses. Um, you do it by starting with the few who represent that category that you've already worked with for a while, of which there were uh, two or three in our LP base. And then you work with them to spread the word in their communities. And the second way you do it is you come up with a very compelling vision of your investment thesis. So if you believe in a particular um, area and that we have to look for something that we think um, the UK might be 
competitive in globally. So for example, um, you may not know this, but in cybersecurity, the UK is one of the leaders in the world. And the US is rather restrictive on letting uh, those kinds of products get exported, whereas we're a little bit more lenient about that, and they're just as good. And um, the, uh, so it's choosing sectors where you can lead, and then basically going and pitching them, saying, this is the area we want to invest in, and would you like to back us in that? OK. Questions? Is crowdfunding funding, uh, creating any interest in Europe uh, like it is here, or is it not an issue? Uh, there are a couple of people trying to put up platforms. Um, the regulatory environment is not very friendly. Um, retail uh, funding in general is highly regulated, and uh, unless, it's, uh, unless you're not going through an intermediary. In other words, the angel networks work because they, in quotes, don't recommend deals. You know, they just have dinners and, you know, just deals sort of happen. But um, anything that acts as an intermediary is so heavily regulated, it's very expensive. And I think that's, um, that's really been quite daunting for people to try and set up. I think there are a couple of attempts, but um, I think the angel networks are frankly far more effective. Have, has anyone had any success in moving expatriated U.S. multinational money that's caught outside the U.S.? Successful in investing that such that that eventually washes them, that money back into their coffers, or do they have to ride that all the way through? Um, in effect, they do that through the acquisitions. I mean, that's what we're pitching. We're basically saying acquire uh, a business and build that business globally from an ex-US center and basically use the cash, but also um, it's, not, it's not avoiding the US taxes. It's, it's generating investment that is high growth for the company. Um, uh, you know, ex-US and therefore they aren't having to pay tax because they're not repatriating it. It's, it's, it's not a, it's not a p and issue, it's, it's a cash flow issue. So as long as you're deploying the cash wisely in investment, then it doesn't matter. You know, that's good for the, that's good for the corporation. Um, the, the most recent, you may be reading, the most recent um, <laughs> Uh, f amusing angles is, of course, the three U.S. corporations that have been absolutely excoriated in the U.K. press for not paying any U.K. tax. And so Starbucks, Amazon, and Google, some, uh, one of the newspapers did an investigative um, report on and demonstrated they weren't paying any U.K. tax. And uh, there was a consumer revolt. People started, stopped going to Starbucks and basically said, you've got to start paying tax in the UK. And so Starbucks has made a $20 million contribution to the UK, <laughs> UK economy <laughs> in order to sort that out. So it's not, it's not just a US issue, but um, I, think, I honestly think it's investing in the business that's the right way to deal with this. The problem is, for example, with Medtronic, Medtronic in healthcare is spending all of its cash generation potential in the US on paying dividends to its US investors. It has no cash flow free to do further investment because all of the excess cash is trapped overseas. Now, we think this is rather interesting for European medical technology companies um, because the dividend demands now are so high here as well for some companies. One more question? Yeah. Oh, whoever. So, uh, this question is, how do you, do you find yourself competing ever against US-based funds? Because they don't just stay here. They go overseas looking yeah. for talent as well. And so if you know that you're more resource constrained, how do you handle, for example, a team that you're looking at, they're in a process with you, uh, you're talking to them, and at any point in time, they can get on a plane these days, go to Silicon Valley and talk to people here. Do you find yourself competing? On, only at later stages. I mean, it, it's not unusual that um, even the US VCs who choose to come to Europe want to write rather big checks to make it worth a while, $20 million and above. And by the time you're writing that kind of check, you're into the Series B, Series C round. So we basically use that interest to attract people into our, our portfolio. We're not competing at the um, early stage end at all. Later stage, yes, occasionally, but it tends to be in very niche, um, hot areas. And as I mentioned before, we're, we're quite 
deep tech and that is out of favor, frankly, at the moment in general. And so we don't find it we're, uh, as a, a problem at all. One final question, and I don't want to put you on the spot. Uh, can you say kind of what the sense is, the commentary is in the UK regarding the autonomy Hewlett Packard issue oh, today? Dear. Oh dear. Um, <laughs> So I saw Mike Lynch speak and he sort of said, I'm, I'm creative except in any area except accounting. Um, uh, the, um, I, look, uh, autonomy was always known for aggressive accounting, but that was public. So uh, that was in the analyst reports. So um, I don't think that should be a surprise. I think there is a deep shock at the, um, the sort of, uh, accusations of fraud and the only thing the sort of uh, you know who knows uh, I, I if it really is fraud it's often concealed so I'm not going to comment on that until somebody finds out um, but the one of the thoughts is that the class action suits around the acquisition price and the write down could be so aggressive here that it was a sort of preemptive announcement in order to defend against that um, by Hewlett Packard um, that's, that's a version. The other version is the aggressive tactics were more than aggressive tactics and well concealed. And I'm certainly not going to comment on which. <laughs> and thank you very much. And our next speaker is Jose de Franca, who I had the pleasure of meeting in Lisbon this past summer when I was doing a project for leadership business consulting. Uh, Jose is chair of Portugal Ventures, which is a new player, but Jose is uh, part of what I, why I found his background interesting is that he's a very unusual example of a professor, entrepreneur, <coughs> investor. Um, we have a few of those here in, in Silicon Valley and the United States, but they play an even more important role in Europe uh, in terms of their ability to change the university cultures and break down the barriers between industry and academia. So Jose, it's a pleasure to welcome you to Stanford. Please tell us what's happening at Portugal Ventures. Thank you very much, uh, <coughs> Burton. Good afternoon. It's really a great pleasure to be here. Uh, Dr. Lee gave me quite a few topics to cover and I told him, uh, well, I need a lot more slides than, than you are allowing me to have. And then he said, well, fine, but you have to fly through them. So that's what I'm going to do. But still, I'd like to start with uh, quiz time. Do you know this? Of course. It's Stanford. Opened its doors in uh, 1891. Interestingly, about 600 years earlier, we founded the first university in Portugal, which is one of the oldest universities in the world. Do you know this? You should know, not far from here at Berkeley, is actually considered one of the most, the 25, uh, top 25 uh, college libraries in the world. Interesting enough, we also have one in Portugal, which was created about 200 years earlier than the one at Berkeley. With these, as, as well as with many other things, we do carry the proud heritage of one of the world's most ancient nations. Uh, for centuries, we were global entrepreneurs. We were actually pioneers in the VC industry because each one of those trips required a lot of money. Uh, and th there were uh, radical exploratory journeys with high risks and potentially very high rewards, as it should be in the VC world. Interestingly enough, Portugal today is still one of the most entrepreneurial countries in Europe. The big challenge is the content of entrepreneurship is very low, and uh, we have to increase it. So let's look at where we stand, first of all, in the world of R&D and innovation. This is a graphical representation of 52 countries in the world, four dimensions, uh, processes, results, the size of the dot means the resources and the color, the conditions, 
And Portugal is somewhere there around in the, in the middle, actually in the middle of, uh, of the scale. In the top right quadrant, you have the leading nations. Of course, the United States is at the top. It's interesting to narrow down and see how we compared with against, against uh, 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 different groups of European countries. Of course, if we look at the leading countries in Europe, the gap is high in all four dimensions. If we compare with uh, a sample of European Union countries of similar size, the gap narrows down with the exception of results. We do perform better than Eastern European countries, still with the exception of the results dimension. We also perform globally better than Southern European countries, although the results dimension still pulls us down. Now, over the past 10, 20 years or so, there have been steady improvements uh, in building up the pillars of entrepreneurship and innovation. In some of those, we do pretty well today, but as you can notice, the results is, is where focus uh, must, must be, especially uh, creating the foundations for last, long-lasting economic impact factors. Let's uh, have a look at reality be between, uh, behind these numbers and the lessons for change. Over the past uh, 20 years or so, there has been significant investment in science, uh, science and technology, and that has dramatically increased visibility in the world. Actually, Portugal belongs to restricted number of countries in the world that is at the top of the world citations. Still, we have the lowest number of patents for, uh, per 1,000 uh, habitants in Europe. Commercial exploitation of university patents is largely inexistent. Tech companies are mostly trapped in a small internal market. Just a handful of small, medium-sized companies are referenced as world-class in any high-tech segment. Few or no multinationals with established R&D centers in Portugal. Little or no international VC investment in Portuguese high-tech companies. And in the past few years, because of the financial crisis, we are actually seeing fleeing highly qualified human capital that is not being absorbed by the economy. And this is increasing uh, quite recently. Uh, what has gone wrong? A number of things. Scattered investments, which have prevented to build up critical mass. Entrepreneurship has been hampered and still is by cultural aversion to failure. The university system is still captured by the preparing for a job view of education. Uh, today, there is a pretty much universal consensus that change is needed uh, for an entrepreneur view of, of education. No real efforts to transform academic know-how into entrepreneurial capital, lack of international references, both in the venture capital and technology entrepreneurship worlds. Little effort to attract international venture capital. Lack of focus to compete in international markets. Public fund, funding has mostly not done through equity, and that has created weak alignment of interests. And public VC investment has not been followed by qualitative support to companies and entrepreneurs. So I think we pretty, know, pretty much know what needs to, to be done to, to, to change. Now, let me, in a nutshell, let me tell you, was one of the requests of Dr. Lee as well, my story as an entrepreneur, an entrepreneur in a nutshell. Actually, uh, it started in academia. Uh, soon after completing my PhD at Imperial College in London, I went back to Portugal, started a research group as a young assistant professor, and as with anybody else in the world, were years of excitement. The one thing I did different from what was, you know, conventional mindset at the time in Portugal, my mind and my eyes were always abroad. After excitement came, fr came frustration. Frustration because I quickly understood that the knowledge that we were producing could not be absorbed by the economy. Um, and we were feeling increasingly disconnected by, uh, from the country as a whole. And at that time, what we have to do is to resist the resignation. 
And then we looked for solutions. The first one was to use the network that by that time I had, I had already built in the world and help my students to find job opportunities abroad. Of course, that was not a sustainable solution. And then I tried to look for international investment to set up an engineering center in Portugal. That was very close to happen, actually, but it didn't. And then, of course, you go to the third solution, which was to do it yourself. At that time, back in 1997, to do it at, at a university in Portugal, you needed to be brave or maybe unconscious. And I think that's what we were. Uh, so the opportunity that we actually saw was to take advantage of three things that were happening. One was the structural disintegration of the value chain in the semiconductor industry uh, with the emergence of the intellectual property business with focus on design engineering. The increased strategic value of analog technology for system on chip integration and very scarce resources that were available worldwide. And then, of course, the second paradigm shift in the industry, moving from the PC to consumer electronics, uh, and the consumer market was a gross engine for our business. So we started and we grew very fast. In 10 years, we grew at a compound annual growth rate of 43% a year, of course, powered by people. Going beyond borders, we, we created a, a number of engineering centers outside Portugal, and we were actually pioneers in some of those countries, like in Poland and in Macau. We were only selling in the world. We never had a single customer in Portugal. Uh, by 2006, uh, 20 of the top 25 semiconductor companies in the world were our customers. According to Gartner DataQuest, we climbed the ranks of, uh, of the market. We were in the top 15 IP companies in the world, and we were actually leading some, in some niche technologies like data conversion, USB, and so on and so forth. Uh, we raised capital. Uh, as an exception, 60% of the capital raised came from international sources. And then by 2007 was the exit. At that time, we had a global headcount of 340. Uh, we had raised about 25 million euros of venture capital. To get the dollar number, we just need to at about 30% at the rate today. Uh, the company was acquired by, by MIPS, uh, probably now was a Stanford company years ago, started by Professor John Hennessy. Uh, the, the exit provided a pretty nice return for my investors and still to this day is one of the largest semiconductor exits in Europe. Today is actually part of Synopsis. In the meantime, there were seven spin-offs out of uh, the company, uh, three of them even outside Portugal with former uh, engineers. And uh, particularly for me, one of my greatest pleasure was to, to receive the 2010 Industrial Pioneer Award of the IEEE Circuits and Systems Society. And very proud because uh, three very distinguished uh, previous recipients include Art de Gales, the CEO of Synopsis, Henry Samueli, co-founder of Broadcom, and Paul Jacobs, uh, CEO of Qualcomm. So I'm very, very proud of that. So uh, the question is, is it possible to change? And certainly it is, and I'm very optimistic. Global success is possible. There is not such a thing as a country course, curse. International references and positioning international markets are crucial elements for competitive, competitiveness, and this can happen in Portugal. Quality projects will always attract international investments. That's my belief. Global networking is a must. Our talent can be as good as any other talent in the world. Access to foreign talent is fundamental to complement local know-how and achieve critical mass. Execution and a sense of urgency are probably more important than just good ideas, and the alignment of incentives is uh, fundamental to induce success. These are some of the things that we did, and we do believe that if we create an environment to have them replicated, there is no reason why in the future we will not be able to see many of those uh, stories in my country. Now, coming to Portugal Ventures, actually, Today, there are two public entities participating in the 
uh, venture capital and the private equity industry in Portugal. I will come back to Portugal Ventures in a minute. The other one is PME Investments, is the investment society for small, medium-sized companies, of which I'm also a chairman. Uh, we have about, at PME Investments, we have about 1.5 billion euros of assets under management, and we have contributed with about 12 billion euros injected in the economy, which has been particularly important in the past three to four years. Um, we are a limited partner, and as such, we, uh, our main goal is to develop a private venture capital and private equity industry in Portugal and stimulate the emergence of new players and attract international investment. And we can participate with a symmetric sharing of risk and profitability with private investors. And we do believe this is a quite interesting proposition that we are discussing with, uh, with investors internationally. As for Portugal Ventures, uh, I was uh, appointed by the government head of the three previously existing venture capital companies uh, back in February last year. Uh, I had a mandate to merge the three companies. This was completed by June, and that was when Portugal Ventures was founded. We manage about 26 funds. We have about 600 million euros of assets under management, and we have a portfolio of about 100 companies. The reform um, was made to foster private venture capital and develop entrepreneurship uh, open to the world. A few important goals, clarify strategic objectives and concentrate resources for public investment, rationalize resources, act as a catalyst, develop Portuguese entrepreneurship, create a new business landscape with high export pot potential and global competitiveness, and most important to focus on the creation of economic impact, impact factors with a sustainable and long-lasting foundation. One of the things that we are doing is to repositioning uh, from an area where investments were scattered and the average tickets for investments were low into another area where we want to achieve critical mass and most important to be able to better support the companies where we are going to invest in. The other very important goal is to open up the national ecosystem to the world, both inbound by attracting capital and talent and outbound uh, by promoting the globalization, internationalization of the company. Uh, very soon, still this month, we'll be setting up a base here in Silicon Valley. Later in the east, we, uh, later in the year, we'll go east. Not to the east coast, but to Asia, as it should be. We do invest in pretty much the three main uh, stages of um, investment following the enterprise maturity, seed innovation capital, venture capital, and private equity. And this is particularly targeting to the consoli uh, consolidation, internationalization, and turnaround of our traditional uh, industries in tradable sectors. Just a few examples of where we invest. We invest in medical devices and healthcare. We, had quite a, we have quite a few promising uh, portfolio companies. Uh, one is this, developing devices for monitoring the body dynamics and preventing pathologies and controlling uh, human posture. The other one is this, uh, is uh, very, very well protected from a patent point of view. A company developing advanced technology for point of care for, uh, for the point of care business, and we do believe that ha it has quite interesting competitive advantages compared to other, other players uh, out there. Um, in the ICT uh, sector as well, a company that is gaining a lot of traction here in the US market, develops end-to-end -end application development operations uh, platform, and another one that is also gaining a lot of traction here in the US, competing with, uh, with peers, uh, with, uh, with a lot less money than uh, its uh, US peers have, have been able to get, develops all-in-one hotel uh, digital marketing uh, technology. And two interesting ones, Windfloat is actually a US company that we were able to bring back to Portugal, is developing a deep water offshore platform. They have already injected in the na national grid more than three gigawatt 
hour of energy, and BERT with a bridge engineering company, which is quite interesting because they are really rev uh, revolutionizing the way bridges are built by emulating the way the body and the mind controls an arm. They have developed an uh, electronic control mechanical system that is able to position the surface of, of the bridge and to maintain it uh, with, with great accuracy. Quite, quite interesting. And last year alone, they have won uh, eight, eight, dig eight digit um, number uh, contracts in the world. Uh, finally, uh, a program up to the world. We launched the Ignition program. Part of this program we call for project submissions in our call for entrepreneurship that runs four times a year. The objectives are to promote and facilitate access to venture capital investment of projects in seed and proof of concept phase of development, to grow the deal flow, to stimulate the creation of new companies, technology-based, to promote economic value of science and technology, and to retain and attract talent. And as I said, this program is open to the world with the condition that people would like to move and, uh, and set up base in Portugal. Some of the key aspects, we are targeting to invest 20 million euros a year. There will be four calls per year. We have just concluded the first call at the end of last year. We promised fast processing, three, three months from submissions to execution of investment contracts, evaluation by an international panel, investment per project between roughly 100 and 750k euros. Portugal Ventures will always retain a minority stake, participation in follow-on funding rounds depending on the development of the projects, international network and mentoring, and facilitate, facilitating as, uh, access to strategic partners and international investors. This is being done with a network of partners that we are building up in the country. We started with six. Today we are already about 30 and we are virtually cover, covering all the, the research centers, universities, incubators, accelerators in the countries. And uh, that's it, thank you very much. Just one final note. Um, we do speak the language of those who visit us. You may not know, but 42% of the Portuguese population speaks a foreign language. By and large, English is the first foreign language. And remarkably, 25% of the Portuguese population speaks two foreign languages. So welcome to Portugal. Thank you very much. Hi. Hi. How do you compare your plan of execution to Chile, for example, or Singapore, which I think have done an incredible job in promoting entrepreneurship and the ecosystem? Well, <clears throat> uh, two quick answers. First, we are not reinventing reinve anything. We are learning what the world has done well. Uh, to be honest, my reference is not Chile or Singapore. My reference is Israel. Um, I know it's going to be tough, but that's, that's, that's our reference. Now, Chile has done well. The, they have the Startup, uh, Startup Chile program. Uh, it, it's, I don't think it's the same as we are doing, because basically what they do, they give a $40,000 check to someone willing to go to, to, to Chile and, and you know, trying to set up, uh, create an idea there and set up bases there. Here we are really looking for uh, technology-based startups, uh, going through the normal process of evaluation, really open to the world. We are not doing it ourselves. In the, 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 the first call that we ran in the last quarter of last, the last, quarter of, uh, last year, we had a panel of uh, 60 experts, half of them from abroad, many of them from, from the valley. Uh, so we, we are really, uh, with this program, we are really to, trying to emulate the Israel incubators program. Not, we are not doing the incubation ourselves. This is done by our partners. So that's why we are trying to align interest and build up this nation-wide network of R&D centers and incubators. What we are doing is to align 
the demand of capital with the supply of, of capital, which is our, our mission. Singapore, to be honest, I don't know very well what they have done, uh, but as I said, our reference is Israel. Another question. I have a question. Um, how well are you engaging the Portuguese universities around this, this area of commercialization, spin-outs, <clears throat> both professors, rectors, and students? Uh, good, good question. Uh, I mean, the university system is today in Portugal, the, I would say, not, not the only, but the, the major source of entrepreneurship that we can have. The source of entrepreneurship that you find here in the US coming from, you know, people coming from big companies with ambition to create the next big company, that does not exist in Portugal because we basically do not have those big tech-based companies. So the source of entrepreneurship must be from the university system. Uh, and there are basically three classes of, of people that we can address, the professors, the postgraduate students and undergraduate students. And the graduate students, the way we view it, they are an exception. They will not be the rule because they still do not possess the deep knowledge, the state of the art knowledge that should be used to set up strong foundation for developing tech-based companies. So the big target should be professors and should be postgraduate uh, post students. The, the first response that we had in this first uh, the call for entrepreneurship was, was pretty significant and most of the projects that we have received actually came from the university system. Uh, now I'm pretty personally pretty curious to see how the second, to see whether we basically managed to dry up everything that was available in Portugal or whether actually we are creating a momentum and uh, some, some um, uh, dynamics to, to see the deal flow grow and people coming up with new ideas and, and have the courage to, 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 to submit them to, to these programs. We'll, we'll see. Okay, I'd like to invite Anne and Jose to come up front for a couple minutes uh, to bring the discussion more into a UK Portugal <coughs> mode. Do you or, yeah. yeah do you want to stand rather than Standing's fine. Okay. <laughs> well, do you want to sit <laughs> No, I'm, I'm fine. Okay. We discovered um, that we're, we've actually got a long history together as nations. Absolutely. So, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, fighting the French, in case you didn't know. Yes. <laughs> not only, not only, <laughs> not only the French. So yeah, the, 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 the oldest uh, political alliance in the world is more than 600 years old. Is the one between Portugal and, uh, and England at that time, now the UK, is the Windsor Treaty. Yeah, the question about the, whether the, uh, you see anything positive coming out of the EU in terms of funding R&D. I see all these big projects and I never see anything coming out of the other end in the marketplace. <laughs> Is there any uh, you know, light at the end of the tunnel there, or is that just wasted money? Uh, no, come on. Uh, um, um, so uh, there, there has been a shift from research to research and innovation in the policy thinking. It's just very slow. And um, the other shift has been to, uh, which is related, is, is to collaborate with business um, more and have it be more business-led. Uh, the problem with the EU is it just moves so slowly. I mean, it's so well-intentioned. I mean, they're really good, they're really smart people, and they just take forever. And the, uh, so I got involved in, in planning the innovation policy in 2011, and I said, okay, so when's this gonna get implemented? And they said, well, the budget doesn't start till 2014. And so we were working on what the innovation policy was going to be for three years time. And, uh, but it was gonna last seven years. So um, I hope, is the answer, and uh, I'm certainly involved in order to try and work on that. Let, let, let me give you my personal experience. Uh, at university, I benefited a lot from European Union funds. Uh, most of my research group uh, was actually funded by European Union funds. You, you, at one point in time, I even decided not to submit projects in Portugal. That was a total waste of time. Uh, and that really allowed me to build up the capabilities, 
that were later on important to, to start up the company. Uh, when we did start the company, uh, I, I told my colleagues, now our subsidies must come from the market. So we never used again funds from the European U Union, never. But at university, to support and fund an R&D driven capability build up program, that was very important, as it's still important today in Portugal. The big challenge, as uh, some of those graphics that I think have shown, which you know, are specific to Portugal, but I don't think will be too different from the European Union as a, as a whole, is the focus on results. There has been too much funding of science and very little, very little funding of um, economic uh, valuation of, of knowledge. Question in the back. The, the part of, your, uh, of the EU? Well, I, I hope it will stay in the, in the European Union for as long as I, I, I will live, so. You can also say question to the Brits. Well, I was going to say, <laughs> <laughs> it's more relevant question to the UK, actually. I actually have a question. You mentioned the LP, so efforts to the, the regulatory burden. Is there, are there any efforts on an industry-wide level to address that in Brussels? And oh, absolutely. Yeah, we have a huge victory. We managed to get a VC <coughs> regime passed through Brussels that allows VC funds from any country in Europe to market in any country in Europe to raise money. And that will come into force in the, in the middle of this year. And that was a specific uh, campaign that, the, uh, that EFCA went on. And it almost founded on tax issues, which of course, EU should have no involvement in because it's not a fiscal body. But um, nevertheless, they tried to. And the, and the way in which it was compromised was that basically, as long as you have a fund based in an EU country, so it excluded the Channel Islands, um, and uh, then you'll get that marketing passport, which is a big deal. Uh, just one point of comparison. Anne, in your slides, you showed, I think for your third fund, 68% of the deals were serial entrepreneurs. Yeah. Jose, what does that number look like for Portugal in terms of percent of serial entrepreneurs? Not, not yet. We are not yet there. We are, we are still in the first generation of entrepreneurs, I think. Okay. We, we have uh, um, the, the significant uh, content of our portfolio is in our traditional industrial sectors. But these are, I mean, these are fairly competitive, even technology-based industrial sectors. I mean, Portugal, for example, the first uh, export in the country is precision machinery, which you know we probably would not imagine. Um, and that's where we have the big companies. I mean, some of our portfolio companies are multi-billion euros companies. Um, the 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 big challenge for the country is to really create a, a totally new environment for technology-based companies, as pretty much you see happening here in the Valley or, or in the UK or elsewhere in Europe. And this is something that will take 10, 20 years to, to, to be done. It's, it's, a long, it's a long process. You, you need determination, you need persistency, and you need, you know, uh, a good course of action that uh, should not be derailed uh, politically, let's say. I mean, the reason that I'm so supportive of the EU's investment in research and innovation is that it's one of the few areas that you can get political alignment around and between nations. Um, it's, it's, it's amazing, uh, you know, both of our political, core political parties, although the Lib Dems would consider themselves one, are are 100% behind increasing investment in research and innovation. And this is at a time when there are cuts everywhere else in the economy. And I find working at the European level, uh, there's the same um, conviction that investment in technology and innovation is what's going to get the sort of growth engine going again. And that's from Germany, it's from Sweden. Um, it, and so it's sort of one of the areas of agreement, which when everything else is so fractious. 
we have, whoa, okay. Uh, Anne. Yes, I was wondering One or two more the, questions. Uh, a few years ago, uh, Britain uh, dismantled the regional uh, emission uh, structures No. No, they 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 dismantled the things called the RDAs, but they were mostly involved in infrastructure and they did a little bit of innovation. And I've been very heavily involved in a national innovation body called the Technology Strategy Board that took over those responsibilities and have focused them much more effectively. So it's not lost. Uh, our final question from the back. Uh, you, you said that yeah. Um, yes. I mean, they're very aware of the problem. Uh, there's a horrible statistic that um, in the first half of 2012, um, I think close to 40 percent of the money raised by the European venture industry came from government, which is just horrible. Um, and it was a tiny number as well. Um, but what they are doing is, uh, in the UK, there is a um, upside invested, upside oriented co um, LP structure, which is run by a group called Capital for Enterprise, where they will deploy money and let the, they take a gilt return and then they basically step back from the profits and let the super profits go to the private investors who go alongside. So they don't ever take risk in terms of their, um, it's more of a Yosman type program. They're, but if the fund is successful, the private investors do better. So that's a specific initiative. There are lots of other types of tax driven initiatives around, dotted around Europe. The tax ones tend to be um, successful at raising capital and very poorly deployed because they are usually kind of um, invested for the wrong reasons, they're too short term, there's, you know, they do, they do help with flow of capital, but they're not nearly as effective as the ones that actually are really thoughtful and coincide with the sort of length of time it takes to really build companies, which is much longer than that. Jose, would you like to make any final comment? Or? Let's go in the back. Um, the raising capital, we, we don't have that problem so far because uh, most of our funds are, are public funds, uh, about 75% of our funds. We do have about 5% of European funds and 50% and of uh, private funds, mostly coming from the banking system. Through the other society, the investment society that I mentioned, we do in, inject money. Into, into private operators. And there, uh, we see a difficulty from them in raising the, the capital need, needed to match the public funds that we, we bring in. Last year alone, we have uh, put 100 million euros into a number of private funds. And we have put about 25 million euros in developing the national network of business angels. And, and that's, a, that's a lot of money. The big challenge is, is actually for those operators to be able to raise funds outside or with less support needed from the public funds. Before we wrap up, I have a couple of announcements. Uh, this year, we're bringing in four new countries who we haven't covered previously, the first of which is Portugal. So Jose, Jose has been our first Portuguese speaker. Uh, I'm also happy to announce that on March 11, we'll be featuring our first Polish speaker out of Warsaw, out of the uh, startup boot camp, Hard Gamma Ventures. Um, so that will actually give us three Eastern European new, new entrants into the speaker lineup from Slovakia, from Poland, and um, from Slovenia. Uh, those of the enrolled students who are interested, who've said they can join us tonight who, and who are interested in joining us tonight, please come down and see me because we need to coordinate logistics. And finally, don't forget, next week are our speakers from Italy and Ireland, Maurizio Rossi of H. Hart Farm Ventures just outside of Venice, and John Breslin of the University of Galway and Boards.ie from Western Ireland. Thank you very much. We'll see you next week.